All right, um, so we'll just do introductions real quick. So I'm Chris Angwalson with Health Scholars, um, and our company does uh, clinical education and simulation training for hospitals and first responders utilizing VR. Marianne Chaudhry, the CEO of XR to Lead, and we do XR for Enterprise, end-to-end -end solutions for immersive learning. Yep, Joe Connolly here with Sketchbox. We build tools to make creating training simulations easier, and we build training simulations for companies like IBM, 3M, and the US Air Force. Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Metter. I use he, him, his as pronouns. I'm with JMXR and do a lot of advising with startup companies, specifically within the training and travel and entertainment spaces. Hi, I'm Amy Hedrick. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Cleanbox Technology. We address hygiene specifically um, in XR, so we decontaminate medical grade decontamination of headsets between users. And um, we solve another, a lot of other logistical challenges. And if you're out there and you're wanting lunch, come back in because we'll, <laughs> it'll, food will still be there later. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right, cool. Well, let's get started. Um, and we will take some questions from uh, folks in a little bit. So let's maybe start with kind of an easier question. Um, so Amy, I'll start with you at the end. What was the biggest challenge that you faced as a startup last year and what do you anticipate this year? Wow, um, well, it's always challenging being a startup, number one. But um, it's very exciting being one in this space because there's so much growth happening and I would say, you know, part of the challenge is also the, the, the growth of the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, it's growing quickly, but then there are also, the, you know, it's, it's kind of a step forward, step back, step forward, step back, and that pace itself ha can be a challenge sometimes. For our company specifically, um, there's been a lot of times where we've spent educating people. Okay, let's talk about, I mean, these are really cool, we're, we're arguably on the, you know, operations, we're not the exciting, quote unquote, exciting mm -hmm. part of the XR space, but we solve the problems be that, you know, you tend to not think about when you're focused on the content creation, which is equally important. Um, so, so biggest challenge of 2019, um, educating people on thinking about how to scale something out, how to globalize it, um, and how to make it um, a, a turnkey um, approach to how you're mobilizing XR in whether it's enterprise, healthcare, or entertainment. Yeah, I, I think our company's had a similar experience. Within the yeah. last year, I would say it's all been about education. It's really been about yeah. getting people to understand the differences between the technologies and the hardware. Um, and then the year ahead, I see it as really, how do you operationalize, right? right? So exactly. for, for our end, it's going to hospitals and first, first responder organizations. And how do you create a business plan around XR? Um, and what does that look like? Yeah, definitely. <coughs> All right. Um, so Jeff, let's um, talk a little bit about um, maybe what kind of adoption challenges you see in the marketplace and, and how there, you dealt with that. There, there's quite a few, um, and I think, I, but I think that we're starting to break through those, and people are really starting to understand that there there is a lot of enterprise value in using immersive technology. It is, it is really key on solving a lot of problems when it comes to productivity, when it comes to training, when it comes to collaboration. There are a lot of, there are a lot of boxes that this can check. But as far as the adoption goes, the trick is how do you actually internalize that within the organization? What, how do you start to deal with this new hardware that's required? How do you deal with the location that is required? Because it does require, it often requires some specific, perhaps dedicated space for this. Um, specifically, if you're looking at things like training, how do you start taking this new, this new tool, this new content, and integrate this into your learning curriculum? And people are really finding that they need to go back and with this technology, it is giving them the opportunity to rethink how they're, do, how they're approaching a variety of different areas within their enterprise. So if you look at this from a training perspective, they need, it's not just, oh, well, let me go buy a VR headset or an AR headset, buy a little bit of content, and now we've got a solution. There's another step to that of how do we really rethink our training program to make sure this becomes an integrated <coughs> part of what we're doing. And that's where I think a lot of people are pausing uh, the adoption because they're taking a little bit extra time to think about that part of the problem. So, Mary, I was just going to ask, have you run into the location issue 
kind of the consulting and the groups that you're working with? Yes, because we, since we are on the eastern coast, um, first of all, getting people to know what this is and how it can be integrated is the first step. And then you can get them, because like uh, Jeff said, a lot of people would like to integrate it into their curriculum and their organizations, but they don't know how. They're, they need those people still uh, out there who can help them to integrate that. And um, for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to use it. And the difficulty in it is that until you put on a headset, you cannot experience what it is to be in that VR um, realm and everything. So we've got a lot of videos where we show you, this is what it will look like, this is what we'll do. But one thing that people are not understanding is that you, it's, yes, it's really fun. Let's put VR and AR into our training curriculum. But being a part of the blended learning approach, it's going to be at the tail end. You're still going to need some aspect of concept building and some aspect of practice. And you can't let critical thinking and problem solving escape you through this process. Yep. Okay. We we found the same thing. So some of the work we do with the Air Force, obviously they have a lot of training, right? Um, they have simulators that cost tens of millions of dollars. They have planes that cost a quarter of a billion dollars and you need to fly missions on them or fly missions in a simulator that could cost $10,000 an hour or just to run that sim. And so figuring out, and they've had this training for 50, 60, 100 years, yeah. right? And so going into them with this very established training curriculum and figuring out, okay, where does VR fit? Right. Yep. VR doesn't fully replace flying an airplane. It doesn't replace being in a $10 million simulator either, but it's definitely better than reading a textbook, right? Yep. And so where do you put that, and how do you um, like measure the value you're getting out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, to that note, actually, I think that's, that's part of the challenges. This is a, um, this is a, a, a quick-moving, fast-moving um, industry, and we're talking to very established you know, large, you yep. know, big ships that don't move that quickly. <laughs> and showing how they don't have to really reinvent the wheel to take advantage of everything that XR has to offer, but how you can actually solve smaller challenges along the way. I think that that's really, really critical to getting that engagement that you guys are talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. yeah, I think the other interesting piece too is, you know, kind of talking about these enterprises who don't move very quickly and where does it fit in? I know the other piece that we found um, to be compelling with them is the repeatable nature of the technology. Mm -hmm. So when we talk a lot about the training that exists right now, it's, it's either very expensive or it takes up a lot of space or it's very time consuming to develop um, the training itself. And the beauty of the technology is that it's faster, it's easier to do, and it's repeatable, um, which makes a big difference for them. So, It also depends on the hardware because, for example, if you have a Rift or an Oculus, everything that that enterprise is going to be making is going to probably be on those headsets. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of those people who are into the training, they want to make it hardware agnostic, where it can run across different platforms. Yep. So. That is one of our, our <laughs> biggest challenges right now, is making all of our content agnostic between all right. the different devices. Um, so I guess to that point, that's probably a good question for the panel, is if we think about hardware, um, you know, Mary, maybe I'll start with you, is what's been your biggest challenge on the hardware front? On the hardware front, the, th the issue is that when you put on the, it's the VR headsets, people don't like putting them on. <laughs> They'll ruin right. your hair, plus people are germaphobes <laughs> and things makeup. like that, ruins your makeup <laughs> and things like that. So even right. if you see at trade shows where people have these, Boeing or NASA, they have, hey, put on the VR headset and it'll show you how, it'll look when you're in space. People are a little hesitant, especially yeah. us females. Yeah. We're, we don't want to put those things on that like 50 people have put on um, ahead of us. And uh, that's uh, one of the issues. But once you're in there, another issue for the VR is that 10, 15 minutes is the max that you can be in there. A lot of people start um, experiencing dizziness and headaches and things like that. Right. And I wouldn't say a remedy, but a good alternative to that is the AR. For example, you can look at it on the phones. It has nothing to do with messing up your hair or makeup. And um, it's just a balance. And it also depends on the culture of the organization. How tech savvy are they? Everybody has a cell phone. So do I really need to buy that hardware in order to get this training done? Let's see if we can have it across MR, I'm sorry, AR and VR. Whereas you can use your cell phones, which is easier, quicker, and everybody has a smartphone these yep. days. 
Yeah, for us, um, I think the hardware challenges we faced last year versus this year are completely different. Last year, you know, we had a Quest prototype, and you could go in and show that around, but you know, the enterprise couldn't buy an Oculus Quest, <coughs> yeah. couldn't buy a standalone headset, and now they can go into Best Buy or Amazon for $400, have it the next day. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the question for the enterprise between okay, standalone, whether it's a Vive or a Rift, you have to have a high-end computer, you have to have someone that manages that computer, yeah, yeah. you have to have a dedicated space, et cetera, et cetera, uh, versus here's a thing that fits in a little box and yeah. it just works. Yeah. Um, and that's a totally different um, conversation we're having now. So last year, that was our challenge. Um, this year, it's really about, okay, now that you have these devices, um, how do you distribute them throughout the organization? Right. Um, and how do you let people really access the training that's on them easily? Right. Yeah, Quest, Quest Enterprise has been a game changer yeah. for us this year, Definitely. for sure. Um, you guys wanna go ahead. Oh, uh, I was gonna say, what, <laughs> <laughs> the other nice thing, uh, Mary, one of the things that you had brought up about using smartphones for this is that really is a very easy sell to the IT department. Um, because a lot of times when you're dealing with these enterprise solutions, a lot of people are talking to people who are in manufacturing or in training or in different departments, but they tend to lose sight of the fact that this is a technology solution and probably you know, Acme Incorporated or whoever you're working with, their IT department is going to want to get involved with this. When you start dealing with devices that people are familiar with, it really reduces that friction that you're going to have for the adoption because the IT department probably already has some policies in place for issuing smartphones, issuing tablets, et cetera, but they may not have the same for uh, VR headsets. It could be, um, I mean, it depends on what your use case is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that, you know, using a smartphone and it's some sort of AR, AR application could be a good gateway if you're a large organization and you're struggling to figure out a way to at least introduce your teams, your individual teams to it, um, and you don't quite have a comprehensive approach yet. Um, but on, on a couple notes, I mean, so we're hardware agnostic. We work with any kind of HMD, whether it's VR, AR, XR, MR, anything, anything that you wear on your face or head. Um, so that hasn't been a challenge for us other than some of the more, you know, kind of uh, experience, customer experience issues that everybody saw, like wearing it over glasses, for instance, or the fact that it's too, I can still, no matter what headset is in, I can still see below, you know, like look down and I can see. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I guess my head is not, is too, my face is too small or something. Mm -hmm. right. And I don't think that that's an uncommon problem. Um, but when you were talking about, about uh, 50 people, you, you know, who, who's used the headset before you, that is one thing that as a company that we've focused on. Our, my my co-founder and myself, our background is premium experiences for, for end consumers as well as we're a B2B company. But um, thinking about those solutions and thinking about people are not going to want to wear this if it smells, if it's wet, if it's this, if it's that. So solving all those problems at once, um, you know, that's that's been important. Mm -hmm. But on on that note, I think for the for the hardware side, I think um, so. We haven't had necessarily those hardware challenges, but the companies I think that are dealing with that, figuring out what they want to use, which headset's going to be. Um, there are committees that are starting to form and put white papers together and share, you know, here, if, you, if you're using uh, VR for this particular use case, let's just say you're using it in surgical theater or something along those lines. You're using surgery, maybe you're going to use this one because it's very good at X, Y, Z. Um, those comprehensive, you know, approaches, I think, will probably help mm -hmm. yeah. everybody. I know that's... That's had to become a lot of our, a big part of our sales process as we've gone in to meet with different organizations is basically creating an exercise for just that yeah. of helping them understand, OK, well, what are all the different use cases you may have within uh, your clinical training and what are the pros and cons of all the different headsets? And to be honest, what a lot of our organizations are finding is that there isn't a one size fits all solution for everything that they want to do. You know, for our training, we tend to push them towards Quest because it's just, it's mm -hmm. portable mm -hmm. and the setup's easy. And um, But for some of them, a phone may be all they need. And for others, they want a very fixed, um, permanent type of solution with really high-end graphics, more like that surgical training type of realm. So, um, yeah, I think that's become a well, big part of our You're trying to lower the barrier selling. of entry. So you're, yeah. you're, you're recommending specific things. Yeah. 
for that. I mean, unfortunately, I think one of the hard parts of being a startup in our business is that everything you do has to have a consultative nature yep. to it yep. in your marketing and your selling yep. and mm -hmm. just your business development and your planning, um, even to a certain degree as you look at your product. It's, it's kind of all consultative. And kind of everybody's a hardware company, whether or not yep. you're making hardware, <laughs> because <laughs> it, hardware is going to always be part of the conversation during any sort of consultative uh, discussion or a sales discussion. Yeah. One thing I wanted to, to mention, because you had you on on uh, the note of what you just last said, uh, in terms of working with the IT department, I think one of the challenges too in, in adoption of whatever your solution might be is that you don't always just deal with one department. The decision mm -hmm. maker is not necessarily the IT department. It is not necessarily right. sometimes I'm talking to the CEO and sometimes I'm talking to a middle manager and sometimes right. someone on my team is talking to the IT department. And I think that will change. Uh, and I think it will still be probably industry, uh, you know, vertical, business vertical dependent. Um, but just thinking, uh, you know, as a startup, going back to the challenges and what it's like to be a startup, is that you have to think outside the box, um, uh, no pen intended on clean box, but <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally all the time. And, 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 and think about it creatively, like you're, you're helping people understand a, something new that you have. Um, they probably need to visualize it as much as you would need to visualize a new concept. So how can you make it easier for them? How can mm -hmm. you, you know, say, before you even encounter this problem, let me tell you we've already solved it. Mm -hmm. yep. And adding on to that is also the type of corporation or organization you're working with. For example, if you're working with defense, you can't bring smartphones in there. Yep. So you have to yeah. cater, you can't bring smartphones and they may want something based on the culture of their organization where there's a high um, intense confidentiality and you can't bring cell phones, you can't have cameras. So being a startup, you also have to look at the nature and pro provide the solution that will fit their organization, not just something that's been done before. Yeah. Very good. Um, so let's talk a little bit, probably about everyone's favorite question as a startup is <coughs> funding. So how do you keep going and what are the different paths that, that everyone um, has taken? So Joe, maybe why don't we start with you? Yeah, I mean, so we went through Y Combinator a year and a half ago. We finished Y Combinator, uh, raised a seed round. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's definitely positives and negatives to taking venture capital. Um, because we're able to raise venture capital, we did. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We at that time we had you know no revenue uh, and no customers. It was the only way to keep going mm -hmm. forward. Now things are a lot different. Um, but yeah, it really depends where the company's at. Yeah. So I, I can speak to ours. Ours is kind of an interesting combination of a few different. Um, so you know, our company was fortunate to have some degree of revenue pretty much from the beginning. But part of us continuing is our depth of portfolio. So we obviously needed um, funding to continue to be kind of first to market and expand our portfolio. And we went two routes. One for us, um, grants made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, there is more money than you would think in the grant world. Um, we actually were able to acquire um, a $600,000 grant um, two years ago with NIST, um, and they were really involved in developing technology for first responders. So that was kind of our first foray into funding. Um, and then we also went the VC route. Um, we just finished our Series B. Um, but in that, we're from Colorado, and we thought for sure Colorado's, you know, huge with startups. It's a big tech community, huge in um, bio and kind of med device. We couldn't find a drop. Um, in Colorado. We just did not have luck for some reason. And we actually ended up going um, Midwest, East Coast and had a ton of success. So I think that's kind of interesting too, as I think some people are always afraid to kind of look outside. They think go West Coast, East Coast and Midwest ended up being super helpful for us for VC money. So yeah. Anybody else? The other thing that, that I've just seen with people is they are, I'm seeing people still starting too soon on trying to raise the raise that money yeah. and be and going into that process unprepared. Um, right now, right now more than ever, it's really important that you have not just an idea, but you have demonstrated your ability to deliver on this idea. That can take a, a variety of different formats, but usually that means some sort of revenue, some sort of customers. Even if it, even if those customers are not paying anything, but they're willing to vouch for you and say we can't live without this solution, 
that's worth its weight in gold. And you need to really make sure that you've got some sort of credibility that you're bringing to the table that what you're designing and what you're developing and what you're creating is something that is good, something that is saleable, and something that people really, really want to implement in their organizations. Okay. You want to? Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and I did want to see if folks have questions in the audience that they may want to ask us directly. If there's anyone. <laughs> if not, I've got a bunch of other questions, but if you do, raise your hand. All right, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so one of the things I did want to talk to is... Um, what are, I guess, what are some of the questions you've kind of gotten through um, your journey that you maybe were just unable to answer um, or maybe didn't have good answers for at the time um, that people should be on the lookout for? Well, for us, we're kind of a first to market product line. So I think that comes with its own set of challenges and then back to kind of the funding <laughs> component of that as well. Um, there are a lot of questions for that. I think when you talk about VC money or anything like that, uh, that, that ultimately people in finance are actually very risk adverse. Yeah. Um, and I think coming in as a startup, you have these great ideas and you're very creative and, and you know that you can solve a problem, but just showing that you can solve a problem is never gonna be enough. Um, we've, been, we've been privately funded to date. Um, you know, I'm, going, I'm starting another round right now. Um, but also, you know, so you think about that in terms of how do you answer those questions as a startup? What's right for your company? Um, thinking about the, remembering that not all money is equal. <laughs> um, I think that's really, really important. Um, and then, you know, thinking about how you put together your team, who to ask those best questions. Sometimes there is not anybody. And, <laughs> you know, there's, this is why I guess you, you seek out other people in the space and you, take advice, but you also really ultimately have to be accountable for what, it, I guess, ultimately somebody, somebody's advice might be the best for them, but you're probably going to have to take it and compare it and take notes with your, with your own thoughts on that. So I think being very in tune with, you know, trying to st keep your ear to the ground, what's, what's the industry doing, how are things going, and, and understanding that you might have to just be your own consultant some of the time. Mm -hmm. yep. I often think that the hardest question to answer is, huh? <laughs> because <laughs> because it, it shows that somebody has a fundamental lack of understanding of what it is that you just yeah. said. And <laughs> that means, I mean, it's kind of great that they're asking and, and tipping you off that, oh my gosh, I did not explain this in a way that's really reaching to my audience. Mm -hmm. But those are the sorts of questions that make you really rethink fundamentally, how do I explain what it is that we do as a company? Okay. That's, <clears throat> you're gonna be faced with that all the time. Um, and sometimes you like to say, oh, it's just them. But listen to that question and really make sure that you're able to very concisely and eloquently describe what it is that you're doing, what's the problem that you're solving, who is this for? That's gonna, that's gonna make your message so much clearer. Mm -hmm. However, in, um, in this industry, in AR, VR, sometimes it's very difficult to explain to someone what exactly it is you're doing without a visual. I, I agree, and I think that you raised a really good point earlier, which is you just can't get people to understand something until they put on a headset, until they've experienced it themselves. Right. We are at a severe disadvantage because there's not a good verbal description mm -hmm. of what VR is like, what AR is like. It's like, you know, let me show you. And that doesn't always work. It, really bad on a phone call, for instance. Um, but, it, but I think to your credit, that's, that's one of the big stumbling blocks that we have in those discussions. Right. So on that, I, I mean, we face that too, is how do we fix that? Like, how do we change it? I mean, does anybody have a good, a good solution? Well, the way we've been doing it is that we have, for all the projects that we've done, we have videos that we can put on our website or we can ha we have links on YouTube which we can at right. least show them that when you put on the headset this is the um, this is the view that you'll get and we've even gotten people from uh, big government contractors from for cybersecurity training mm -hmm. who want to use AR and VR for cybersecurity training which is kind of like if you think about it for a second how are you going to do that but once <laughs> they started looking at our videos they were like 
they started getting the ideas on their own. Right. They were like, oh, we could do this and we could do that. I'm like, yeah. we're here to assist you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know one of the things that I'd love to see is from more of the professional organizations kind of within our industry is I'd love for them to start doing road shows. Mm -hmm. So instead of having these giant conferences, no offense, <laughs> conferences are fantastic, but being able to get the product out to the people that are actually going to use it, um, I think would be ideal. Because the more folks that just put it on and see the value and see the value outside of just gaming and entertainment, because that's our other obstacles. People just don't understand there's use cases beyond that mm -hmm. yeah. um, would be the biggest benefit for all of us. But Yeah, I was just going to say there's nothing that replaces actual an actual experience, of course. Right. Right. Um, but one thing that I'm, I'm starting to see a little bit differently is, um, you know, like when it comes to marketing, how do you market VR, AR, MR? And 90% of the time, um, you see a picture of a person wearing a headset. And what I, I personally have always felt that that's a bit, uh, you know, that's not what's going to get somebody to want to try it on. They look like, right. it's yeah, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm not going to wear that big headset thing on my head. Um, but, you know, so showing people more the actual experience within it and, and maybe focusing on that. Like, mm. And I've, I've used this example at other conventions before, but it, it actually had a profound impact on me. We work with companies all over that do different types of training. KLM is one of them, um, and they were they're tra they have a training VR program that um, presumably they've probably updated by now. But at the time, um, I was able to go through and experience. You know, I was I was a flight attendant in first class, and I had to. There was a smoke coming out of of um, the, the baggage areas. And, um, you know, the, the experience started out where it, it was, you know, you see a little bit of smoke, the passengers are calm, there are a few people there, and then there's more and more smoke. And, you know, I have to, as you know, in, in my flight attendant uh, position, have to go find the fire extinguishers, right. and there are two places, and, and then there's more and more smoke. Then the passengers start to notice, then they look at you, then they become aggressive, and one of them starts to walk towards you, and then you hear babies crying. And this is all, you know, like if you just say, hey, I can teach you how to, you know, handle emergency situations. Well, there's, yes, you can say that, and you have to say it get people involved and interested right. but you should you know when you're actually there it's obviously there's no smoke but I, I found myself kind of wanting to cough just in case mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know so I think um, I love the you know the roadshow thing having it in people's hands again it comes back to lowering the barrier of entry to the actual yep. value that it brings mm -hmm. so with just like the last few minutes that we have um, and Joe maybe I'll start with you is mm -hmm. what do you think is what technology or what advancement do you see is going to be the biggest game changer for you in the next year? Yeah, I mean, we're excited about, uh, I mean, the Oculus Quest, if you think about it, um, is from 2017, really, is when the dev kit specs were set in stone. Um, that's almost three years ago. Uh, and if you think about the Quest 2, right, that's not just going to be a two-year improvement. It's going to be about a five-year improvement. Right. Um, and if you start thinking about all of the things you have to do to get a VR training sim to run on a Quest, uh, while the performance optimizations, um, and it doesn't look as good as it looks, obviously, on a, on a laptop or high-end PC. And the Quest 2 is going to make a huge difference for that. Um, the idea, Miriam, you brought up of only being OK for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. I think that'll be solved by the next version of the Quest, because the oh, frame rate will be higher, it'll be lighter. Um, so we're really excited to see that. I think uh, the, the two things that are really going to be impacting that are the overall form factor, which just makes it a much more accessible device where it's, not, where it's easier to put on, easier to take off, easier to clean. Um, and the other thing with that is the uh, expanded field of view. Mm -hmm. I think especially with uh, augmented reality headsets right now, that's so limited that it's, it's preventing some really good use cases in there. Yeah. But, but we're seeing a lot of nice progress. Yeah. I'm sure you can see some in the expo hall yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll say for us, it's a little bit different. Um, voice technology is gonna be huge for us. Um, mm -hmm. So right now, a lot of our uh, simulation um, applications are voice driven. So, because what we're trying to teach is not just uh, the physical mus muscle memory um, and clinical training, but the soft skills. Um, and obviously communication is a big piece of that. Um, we've developed some of our own proprietary and then be, been using um, Google services. And it's pretty good, but it's, you know, it's got limitations. Um, it's not as responsive as we'd like it to be. So I, I think what's coming out in the next year with some of those advances and also within the localization opportunities will, will be important for, for what we're trying to accomplish. So, anyone else? Cool. All right, cool. Oh, I think we have a question over there. Question up there. Cody, do you mind? Thanks. 
Well, thank you for uh, speaking. Oh, wait. I what? think you should have one question. Oh, man, I don't get one. Okay, fine. You can. <laughs> <laughs> hey. hey, thank you for the panel discussions. I have one question. So what's the cleaner app to convince people to buy the ARVR headset? For example, if I'm a consumer. I'm a kind of tech fan. I want to buy one, but how you convince me to buy one AR headset for like daily use, one hour like this? So quick Thank clarification, you. though. Are you trying to convince the consumer to use it for entertainment for their own personal use or for a business use case? OK. Um, right. I don't, th I don't think that right now there is a singular killer app. And I think that's, that's problematic that there's not. Um, but what, what people are seeing is the killer app that's right for them. And so it's very specific to different industries. So if you're dealing with healthcare, it might be in how people are able to train for surgical pr procedures, or it might be to train how they are dealing with patient pain. There are a lot of different ways that that could be the correct killer app for different organizations, but because those needs are so varied, there's not one that has really changed it. One thing that I think is, I'm gonna just uh, correct myself here, or change, <laughs> change direction a little bit. One thing where I think that there is the potential for that is in collaboration, mm -hmm. where you've got teams that are spread across uh, multiple locations and they're able to come together in a virtual space to collaborate on design, just general meetings, et cetera. I think that's something that does have the ability to do that, but we haven't seen it yet. I might, I might just ask, so you, were you talking about the software or the hardware? Okay, good, sorry. I have a question. Uh, what hardware are you utilizing the most? HoloLens, Oculus, yeah. what? Um, well, so we primarily design for VR. Um, we are trying to be agnostic, so we basically do, um, you know, Vive, Rift, um, the Quest, um, so all of them. I, again, our use cases, are, it's very use case dependent on what our customers need in terms of what we recommend. I will say for our own ease of use and what we're doing and what most of our customers are trying to accomplish, we are going with the Quest because it is, all in one, there's going to be an enterprise support, which is huge for healthcare, um, and it's just easy setup. Mm -hmm. So, Amy, like, which yeah. ones are you well, focusing on? Well, CleanBox works for every headset on the market, whether it's you know for everything from the Pimax to the Quest to the Go to yeah. everything. Personally, I mean, I carry around a Go because I travel all the time. And if I'm going to go in all space, I want to take the minimum. You know, if I have to do with something, I, I want it to be comfortable on my head, you know. And I, I ask that because, I mean, I'm hearing that the number one problem is the headset, right? Like putting it on. And, mm -hmm. and that's what the people sitting in these seats. Right. <laughs> and that's what they're working on, right? I mean, this right. is what we're working yeah. on is how do we make these yes. headsets better so we yeah. can enable you to do more. Mm -hmm. How about... Joe or Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we build exclusively for the Quest, um, and that's sort of where we see the future of VR going, that form factor. Thanks. I see, I, I see all sorts of devices uh, out there, um, and it really de it depends on the industry. The Quest is certainly a super popular device. I think that smartphones are also very popular just because it's this easy point of entry for a lot of people. Um, and for some... For some industries, getting a more industry-specific headset, something that's more like a Lenovo that, that fits into a, integrates into a hard hat, those are also really important. So there's a lot of different use cases that are out there. I've seen them uh, integrated into flight equipment as well, yeah. uh, pilot helmets. Yeah. Th I, that was I, awesome. Uh, yeah, military, whatever yeah. it is. I will yeah. just add really quick, though, for, for the hardware folks, like the two biggest form factors that you could do a better job thinking about is designing for non-gamers and women. I can't tell you how many issues have come up specifically for women and like hand size, neck strength, like hairdos. We had to do a whole video that you have to take your hair down. Like headsets don't fit if you've got a ponytail or a bun or you've got, if you're African American and you have, you know, braided hair or things like that. So um, a couple of things to consider mm -hmm. on the hardware end, which is interesting. 
Mayor, and just one, any last quick thing? Just yes, I think that it there. also depends on providing value, and I'm answering both the questions at once, that which hardware to use and um, how to convince you will be on what value we're going to provide to you and how it's going to help you. If we can target that, um, I think, again, it will be agnostic of whatever headset we use, as long as according to your organization, according to your requirements, if we can give you what you need, uh, we can use any of those headsets. But yes, the Quest is very popular for VR and um, AR. There's a lot of um, new uh, augmented reality headsets here in this um, expo as well. Well, I think, we're, uh, I think here we're gonna show you the future and again, mm -hmm. help you grow your company. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I Absolutely. want to. Thank you so much. Everybody give them a big round of applause. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.